19 and a half years ago, an album was quietly released that I wouldn't end up hearing until 2007. Back then, I was obsessed with playing drums on Rock Band and stumbled across this heavy, progressive track that absolutely blew me away the first time I heard it, and I knew I needed to know more. Welcome Home was my gateway to a world that I craved at the time, and going back and starting at the beginning of the story instead of three quarters in, I had no idea it would remain such an influential force almost 15 years later. Though, with nine albums under their belt, eight connected concept albums, and one experimental, how does the debut hold up after seeing and hearing the changes of almost 20 years of artistry? Welcome to the track-by-track -track retrospective of 2002's The Second Stage Turbine Blade. Quickly though, before we begin, a couple of notes. Coed and Cambria have a very extensive lore, spanning between albums, comics, side projects, and more. With a retrospective like this, I'm going to focus primarily on the music found within the album, keeping the events and links to the comics separate, as that's a topic I'd really like to tackle later on. Some songs, especially on this album, are almost word for word as they appear in the comics, but those links aren't the focus of this retrospective. Now, let's get into it. Second Stage Turbine Blade. Hearing this muffled, low quality track brings me back to a point in time I remember so vividly, it's almost scary. I was given a burnt copy of this album by a coworker after telling them about what I had just discovered, and as I put the sharpie written copy into my CD player, I was immediately thrown off. What happened to the burning process? I thought. It sounds like they used a tape recorder and gave me those audio files on a burnt disc. Something's clearly wrong here. Little did I know how crucial this string and piano motif would become. Time Consumer as Josh's bass drum starts to kick, slowly bringing you into the atmosphere of the song, it's complemented by Travis's slide-heavy lead and then strengthened by Claudio's rhythm. I think what I love most about the initial opening is Mike's bass, though. It's apparent, it's thick, but it's not just following the guitar. While it's in line with what the guitar and drums are up to, he's charting a separate path with it, in a similar way that Geddy Lee or Steve Harris would write their parts. All combined together, there's imagery evoked of a calm, starry night, especially with the way the higher notes on the guitars are played. Each of the sets of notes feels like a cluster of shining stars in the sky. Then, what is initially perceived as the complete sound of Coheed and Cambria is introduced. Claudio's voice comes in with warmth and invitation, despite initially unsettling lyrics like, Librarian find me the pole, the one that kicks your head in. And hearing this juxtaposition with the sonic atmosphere created by the band is more than enough to clue you in that something nefarious is happening. Finally, with the line, the one that grabs at your ankle, Claudio's true vocal form has taken shape, and the entire band is now performing in full force. As Claudio sings through that second verse, it becomes exceptionally clear based on the odd intro track and the two minutes of time consumer we've experienced so far that this is not just a song, this is some point in a larger story. Most songs are stories, but not all songs are concepts. The gift that Claudio has for storytelling has just been shown to us. Moving into the chorus, the back and forth between me and my star, Matthew Goodnight, and Maria, my star, Matthew Goodnight, I think is what helped reinforce the twinkling star imagery the opening part of the song had. The big, beating drum kicks following the chorus underneath both guitars that manage to sound erratic when heard together, but have a very clear direction on their own, and the same can be said again for Mike's bass. The way Mike grooves to his own sound is admittedly something I'm really missing in the newer albums, but we'll get to Mike at a much later time. Then something... funky happens. The fourth verse begins. But no one seems in sync, and it's almost like each instrument is on a completely different time signature. But through this chaos comes unity, and as the verse ends, we're thrown in without any warning to a distorted solo that builds upon the lead mini-solos that accompanied each verse throughout the song. 
This distorted, almost blown out sound contrasts so heavily with that opening piece found in the intro. And finally, as we end the song with a synth continuing the rhythm guitar parts and the ominous final lyrics, it's made clear for all to see that a song is more like a chapter than a self-contained story like Rime of the Ancient Mariner. Devil in Jersey City He shabooty! The dark, atmospheric sound of Time Consumer seems almost lost to memory with how much of a shift between tracks 2 and 3 really is. But the blending and challenging of genres are what makes Coheed and Cambria so unique. The main guitar riff is truly the driving force of this song. A simple power chord drives this much more radio-friendly pop-sounding song forward. The drumming is simple, but effective. I suppose those two reasons are why it became such a staple at shows, especially in the early part of their careers. It's a fun, catchy song that fits in well with what was popular at the time, and when you're young and upcoming, it's important to play some of the more accessible stuff from your catalog. I think one of the most interesting things about this song is the liberal use of the F-word sprinkled throughout, yet the album managed to escape without an explicit content warning on the front cover. With such a minimal album cover that doesn't really showcase the band or what you're about to get into, I can't help but wonder how many more people would have picked up the album if they saw that warning. As any artist will tell you when the label was introduced, it's like a marketing stamp of approval to high school kids that what they're about to hear is going to be kick-ass, whether it was in their genre or not. Staying on the topic of lyrics, without knowing any of the backstory, this song seems significantly more cryptic than Time Consumer. The lyrics aren't as expanded upon as they were in Time Consumer, and you really need to rely on what you're hearing from both a lyric perspective and a sonic perspective. The opening verse, New Jersey bound, when sound asleep, they'll find you at your most vulnerable. Pull position, speak up, let out, when down the street, corner boys, F stuff up. Provides you with the most complete details in the song, but even then, the horrors that are being alluded to aren't explicitly stated in the rest of the song, and it wasn't until I was able to sit down and read about what's happening did I reevaluate how this fun, poppy song hits, and how dark it gets. I'm noticing a trend here in the writing and musical composition. There's something so admirable about Claudio being able to hide darkness and horrors in places that don't show it off at first, and I know that he was able to draw that from some very deep and personal places. Breaking from the constant forward momentum of the guitar and drumming, everything slows right down to a quiet guitar, a great bass line, and then a very slow, simple solo before exploding with Mike's screaming backup vocals. It's a great changeup and a fantastic way to end a song that seemed almost formulaic by this point. Everything Evil Oh boy, here we go. I hear those opening cymbal hits, and it doesn't matter where I am or what time it is, the goosebumps hit. For years, when I showed someone Coheed and Cambria, I'd have a list of songs that I'd go through, but always ending with everything evil. I always said the same thing to everyone, this is their number of the beast. And I was so, so close to nailing that comparison with Night 3 of Neverender, where in the middle of everything evil, they stopped and switched to the trooper another maiden crowd-pleaser that they had contributed to the tribute album, Made in Heaven. Honestly, how am I supposed to talk about or provide anything new to everything evil that hasn't been discussed to death by fans already? The terrifying build-up of the vocal performance, combined with guitar work that sounds so erratic with a bass line that is clearly not following any rules, the sudden start and stops, the shouting of lyrics like blood-hungry, cannibalistic, unfit family ties, a series of knocks to the young girl's head side, provide the absolute clearest imagery of what's happening in this story, and it's genuinely horrific. We have clearly defined characters by this point, even if you need to reread some of the lyrics and incorporate the things we have learned from Time Consumer and Devil in Jersey City. Evolve Monstar, show me the things that I've never wanted done. Evolve Monstar, do to me the things I never wanted done. Inspector, I think we've found something over here. Jesse, just come look at what your brother did. Here he did away with me. Let's make this our last day at home by the fence. And she screamed, Claudio, dear Claudio, I wish goddammit we'll make it if you believe. 
We have characters, locations, relationships, deaths, changes. The song absolutely explodes with details, and then it leads into this absolutely incredible crescendo, with Claudio hitting some of the highest notes in his vocal range. The conceptual build-up throughout the song to the final explosion of sound by each member makes this more than just a crowd favorite because it's catchy. This song really is a perfect microcosm of who Coheed and Cambria are, and it shows every time the song is played live. And then it ends with that haunting, unknown theme we heard at the beginning of the album. Delirium Trigger the come down from everything evil into the piano motif seems needed at first glance, with the slow, incredibly heavy bass leading the slow, higher notes of the guitar in Delirium Trigger, until Claudio comes in with that scream and the direction moves forward, hard. There's a similar, dark soundscape being produced to that of Time Consumer, but the quicker tempo and the faint lead notes evoke an image of alarm in the distance. The lyrics take a different approach than Everything Evil, where in that song, it was told in a way more like a traditional story, with location setups, characters talking back and forth, and describing the events taking place. With Delirium Trigger, these are clearly the thoughts and terrors of one character. Though, with such an unreliable narrator in this regard, it's difficult to tell what's actually happening. The softer vocal style, while still hitting some high notes, is a welcome shift at this point of the album. We've seen such a wonderful vocal range, and the way Claudio's voice carries so perfectly with both his and Travis's guitar work manages to create this incredibly smooth performance, continuously punctuated by Josh's drumming. And while not overly complicated, the scale of Mike's bass work is big and apparent, and really provides the sense of dread the song provides, especially with Claudio's quiet, yet ultra-high notes. The build-up towards the ending that culminates in a giant crash with the intense scream of insanity throughout is an amazing payoff, and bringing in Travis to provide secondary vocals is a nice change of pace, providing another voice, another perspective. This is a song that does such a fantastic job of painting the delirium within, and the back and forth between slow builds and explosive payoffs that can give you a mild whiplash are evidence of it. Hearshot Kid Disaster Earshot Kid Disaster opens with this awesome riff. Produced in a way similar to the opening track, it sounds tinny, far away, and like it was recorded through a tape recorder. And then, boom! Like a full frontal assault, the band kicks in and the riff takes the backseat to an opening guitar solo. Not a complicated solo, but one that thankfully evolved over time during live shows. And then to cap off the sudden madness we've been listening to for 25 seconds, Claudio comes in with one of the most blood-curdling screams throughout Coheed and Cambria's entire discography. Though, true to fashion, traditional concepts mean nothing to these guys, and everything takes a huge 180-degree turn into a fun-sounding, almost uplifting song. We're at the point in the album now that really signals to the general audience who might have picked up this album on a win that things aren't going to get less intense from a listening perspective. After five songs of characters, locations, and vague events that may have been happening, by the time you get to the chorus and simply hear Claudio yelling, I need mayo, without context, followed shortly after by Mike shouting something in the background that can be pretty difficult to decipher the first time around, it can be easy for the general audience to completely tune out. I've had many conversations with people about what it is that I love about conceptual music, and a very recurring sentiment that I hear back is, I don't like music that requires homework, which I get. Music means many different things to everyone, and studying a lyric sheet or reading correlating comics can seem more like work instead of tossing on an album like Insomniac or Significant Other and just enjoying the music for what it is. This is a track that I absolutely love. The near constant, forward momentum underscored by Mike's great bass line and the bass to snare back and forth is one of my favorite uses on this album. Josh's bass drum seems to be significantly more apparent in the mix of this song, and I'm always happy to hear that. The general tone, with how light it appears, is really a fantastic switch after how heavy and dark the previous two tracks were, and that trend is about to continue. 33. A quick and snappy drum intro brings us into the song in which the title was quickly adopted by fans across the board as part of email addresses and jersey numbers alike. Featuring a lead riff that I think might be my favorite on the album, 
the high tone of the intro is only bolstered by Claudio's vocals. There's a sense of forward motion that's similar to Devil in Jersey City, though the structure of 33 and the lack of any real changeup makes it the simplest piece on the album. Being the shortest song on the album, clocking in at three and a half minutes, reflects the simplicity of the track. There's a clear pattern of repetitiveness that makes me wonder about the alternate universe where 33 got the music video and Devil in Jersey City didn't, as 33 seems far more radio friendly than Devil in Jersey City. 33 is a cute, catchy track with great lead work and really works well at the three quarter mark to reset some of the highs and lows the story has brought so far right before the final stretch. June Song Provision. All right, you primitive screwheads, listen up. I know I said I wasn't going to really connect the lyrics directly to the comics, but seeing as this is my retrospective, I'm going to allow myself this one exception. This song is incredible, and this is the part of the story that made my eyes widen in a pure fascination, because until I read these lyrics, not in the CD jacket, but on the pages of a comic book, I never once dreamed of such transmedia artistry. My favorite part of discovering the comic after I had listened to the album was finding out that the lyrics to this album are about as word for word as you can get in song form, and seeing the note that Claudio left Nuo on the pages with the melody going through my head almost perfectly is something I'll never forget. I was having fun reading the comic up until then, seeing and comparing the events of the pages versus the events within the album, looking for all those little expansive details that you're just not able to express in the middle of the song. But it was June Song Provision and the literal lyrics written across the page that changed how I perceived art entirely. The opening riff is low and catchy, while the lead playing over it with the higher notes makes for a great combination. The opening lines with Claudio's mid-range highs provide this song with a bright, energetic feeling, but as the song progresses, things slowly get darker and significantly more intense, both musically and lyrically. To go from such a warm, bright opening with a lyric like, Good morning sunshine, awake when the sun hits the sky, to doused in kerosene in a torched, blazed blood bath, when boy sets fire, god knows you've lost, at a cost that has no price, is such an unexpected place for this song to end up the first time you hear it, and I will forever applaud Claudio's writing because of his writing skills, especially in the early days where the bright sonic tones held these deep and disturbing lyrics. The constant repeating lines at the end, the doubling of vocals, the unsettling chaotic guitar work, and the sudden end of it all with a single doubt, promise me that, is such an amazing departure from where the song started, I just love it. And then it ends with those few notes, those recurring piano notes where you know things are getting real. Never Ender. Hardly know her. Admittedly, I've always been curious as to why they chose Never Ender as the name of their four show series, so if someone has an answer, feel free to let me know. I assume it has to do with the fact that I would have wished that these shows never ended, but that's about all I've got. This song, in addition to the final track, are where the progressive notes really start to take hold. The opening riff is fantastic and it pulls you right in, and just as you're settled, this gorgeous bass line comes in and completes the whole package. The continued, simple guitar momentum Claudio has with his rhythm guitar is accompanied by Travis's lead perfectly, and I think this is one of the strongest examples of them working in true harmony on the album. They won't become apparent until the next album, but closing out Second Stage Turbine Blade with Never Ender as the second to last track is really laying the groundwork for what's to come. The ending of this song, with the repeating lyrics, repeating riffs, and hard drumming to back it up become a bit of a staple for a lot of their tracks, especially played live. While it's hardly an original concept, the way that they've adopted it into a bit of a signature throughout their catalog is something that I've enjoyed and will absolutely continue to enjoy. God Send Conspirator Claudio returns with his softer, warmer voice to guide us through the tale of this story. And if you weren't already turned off by the time Hearshot Kid Disaster came on, I'm unsure of how you got to the final track. This is such an unconventional song, and this seems to be the foundation for a lot of their far more progressive tracks on later albums. The constant tempo changes, the incredibly story-focused lyrics that appear like they were written first, with the music actually written around it. It's a procedure that I feel hasn't been seen as strongly on Vaxxus, but actually the color before the sun 
crushed that approach. It's actually kind of funny that despite how representative of Coheed this song is, and how you almost need to know everything about the song to enjoy it to its fullest, the actual composition of it is one I think you'd be able to show just about anyone with an actual appreciation of music to really showcase the musical talent that these guys have. It has the best mix on the album, and each section manages to show a different level of musical prowess with how different they sound, all while being blended together perfectly. Out of all the tracks on the album, this is the one I'd consider the most progressive. The song also sees Josh change up his drumming style a little bit during the chorus, and hearing Mike's bass underneath, constantly charting its own course next to, not underneath the guitar work, is as refreshing as ever. Travis's lead guitar and the way it fits in with Claudio's rhythm is seamless, and this song as a whole has one of the most dialed in vocal performances from Claudio. And then, similar to The Wall, it ends just as it began. Until you get to IROBOT. Found after a few minutes of silence, IROBOT is more like an Easter egg than an actual song, especially in this form. There's really not much to say about this odd little tune on its own, other than the incredible performance of it done during Neverender and how it's wonderfully reutilized on Queen of the Dark. Final Thoughts Coheed and Cambria are an enormous influence on how I interpret, absorb, create, and enjoy art, but that doesn't mean they're my only influence. I'm fully aware that this isn't a band for everyone, and this retrospective isn't about me trying to convince anyone otherwise. It's simply a fun trip through an album that came at such a perfect time for my own artistic journey. The second stage Turbine Blade isn't an album I'm putting on as a whole as frequently anymore, but there's so much to be found here that I still love and appreciate. It manages to sound simple at times, with lyrics that sound like they came out of a blender, but that simplicity is incredible to look back on nearly 20 years and 8 albums later. I am one among the fence.